Thought maybe you boys might be interested in putting on a big time wrestling bout. You know, make a nice hunk of dough for yourself. It's time to fight! Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Morgan, you're out of here. You don't have the right temperament for the trade. You're a dead man. What am I supposed to do? As always, Barber College. Frankie, I know you're a great wrestler, but my brother, who ain't as handsome as you, is as strong as Charles Atlas. Yeah, but I've wrestled women that are bigger than him. Sure, you got fat, sloppy women. Hello and welcome to another Camel Clutch Cinema. This is the show where we talk about movies that either have wrestlers in them or have wrestling in them. I'm Guy Hutchinson. I'm here with Craig Cohen. And today we're looking at the movie Bounty Hunters. Yeah, I'm ready to talk all about it. <laughs> it's a Canadian film. <laughs> this is definitely the first, you know, above the border film we've done. Yeah, and uh, you know what? I was I was thinking about it while I was watching and I'm not sure... That I've ever seen a full-fledged um, independent Canadian production like this, uh, you know, that was a movie. I, I've, I've seen pl- plenty of Canadian TV. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough call because the, pretty much they shoot everything in Canada now. I remember, oh, yeah. I, I think it was X-Files that it was such a big deal that they just moved it to Canada. But now everything seems to move up to Toronto and uh, different you, areas in Canada. So this movie stars Trish Stratus. Uh, it it uh, it came out earlier this year. How did you find out about it? Um, I think I was going through my you know Netflix one day and it popped up in you know new releases. Mm-hmm. See Trish Stratus right there on the cover, and then um, I think that was uh, when it you know when we started to do this show, it popped up on my radar that radar that hey you know what i should finally get around to watching uh that trish stratus movie i see yeah i had never heard of this before you mentioned it to me the other day um mm-hmm. and then I, I checked it out there on netflix and uh well we'll get into it why don't uh why don't you do the plot summary craig all right a group of down on their luck bounty hunters hit the jackpot one night when they pick up an informant with a hundred thousand dollar bounty on his head but their world is turned upside down when a mob boss offers them one million dollars in exchange for the informant when they refuse, the Mafia unleashes a trio of assassins on them who use all of their power to bring the bounty hunters down and to get their man dead or alive. Ooh. <laughs> and Trish is one of the bounty hunters. We should say this film first came out under the name Bail Enforcers, and I found it on YouTube in its entirety in, I think, Czechoslovakian. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it has bail enforcers as the title on that you know video Mm -hmm. and they actually say it quite a few times in the movie yeah they thought that was their title yeah you know i i i was thinking about bounty hunters as we as we as i watched this i was thinking about you know boba fett and Mm -hmm. i was thinking about i was thinking about other bounty hunters it seemed like when i was growing up that that was the coolest thing of all time and then at some point, Dog the Bounty Hunter came on TV. And yes. so I would put Trish Stratus somewhere between Boba Fett and Dog the Bounty Hunter, somewhere in the middle. You know, not sure. the coolest bounty hunter ever, but but not the guy that looks like Linda, uh, Linda Hogan walking around <laughs> with things in his hair. And married to someone that looks like Linda Hogan. Well, absolutely. The, the wives of the... The Linda Bulea, Hogan's original wife, uh, looks as a dead ringer for Mrs. Dog the Bounty Hunter. I remember not long ago I, I, that that scandal came out where Dog the Bounty Hunter had said some things that people felt were racist. Um, seemed racist to me, but uh, I don't know the whole story. But And set up by his own son. Yeah, I recorded him saying things and then <laughs> leaked it. But uh, I remember I was telling somebody about this and he was like, so this is a cartoon? And I was like, no, it's a guy. His name is Dog the Bounty Hunter. And I realized that there was no way to explain Dog the Bounty Hunter to someone that had never heard of Dog the Bounty Hunter. Oh, man, I'm so glad I was not in that position. (laughs) So Trish Stratus, uh, hmm, this is her first film. Came out February 28, 2012. She had done a little acting here or there. uh, But interesting that she chose to leap into film. Yeah, you know, with with this first movie and 
she talked about it with um, an interview she did for IGN when asked how she ended up doing the film, and she said the writer director of the film wrote. No, no, the wait, script. wait, wait, wait. Oh. Uh, let me do the Trish Stratus voice. <laughs> All right, <laughs> sure. <laughs> The writer director of the film wrote the script, which has a f- strong female lead in it with me in mind. He told me that he never imagined that he'd actually get me to play the role, but he knew just used me for inspiration for the role of Jules Taylor. And then it became one of those things where someone knew someone else. And it was the former president of WWE Canada who said, oh, yeah, I can get that to her and so it landed on my desk and I read it and I loved it and I I thought it totally screamed Trish Stratus so he had done a good job of imagining me for the role (laughs) dead on right oh yeah yeah sounds like I just found audio of her you know giving this interview oh definitely (laughs) and the writer director she mentions is a gentleman by the name of Patrick McBreedy who now, uh, doesn't really have much going on in terms of uh, credits. It, it Based on his Twitter feed, it seems like he does a lot of possibly second unit work and stuff like that. Yeah, well, he also may be just starting out. Uh, you yeah. Know, the, I think he had one other credit I saw maybe, mm-hmm. um, but you know, perhaps he's got a lot in the pipeline. And this was the case with a lot of the people working in this film. Uh, the, the other writer on this was mm-hmm. Reese Evenshin. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this was somebody that I looked looked him up or her. Not sure. Reese Reese Witherspoon. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a girl. Possibly. I don't know. But I looked this person up, and uh, you know, all the credits seemed to be this seemed to be somebody that had two or three credits. But maybe in the future we'll have so many that this will be one of those things that people laugh about. They're like, remember when they did that movie with Trish Stratus? This will be like their uh, Piranha Two. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh, what James Cameron wrote that. He wrote and directed it, yes. Uh, yeah. Piranha 2, The Spawning. So uh, so Trish Stratus had been on TV, right? Done some mad TV. Yeah, and she did a, a, a Canadian sketch show. And then uh, post-WWE, she did um, Armed and Famous, which was a reality show. I never saw that. What was that like? Um, I didn't see it either. You didn't see it either? What, I, I, is this the one that she became a deputy in some <laughs> small town or something? Yes, with uh, Eric Estrada. Latoya Jackson, Jack Osborne, and Wee Man from Jackass. It's very interesting. <laughs> it aired back in 2007, and uh, it only ran four episodes. Hmm. So yeah. it doesn't sound like it uh, really blew things up. Let me ask you a question. Sure thing. Dark-haired Trish Stratus or blonde-haired Trish Stratus, which do you like better? This movie seemed to kind of straddle the line and give us a little of each. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I have to say, when she came back for, you know, I guess, Tough Enough. Yeah, when and, she showed uh, up with the dark hair doing, you know, just saying, hey, yoga, do some yeah. yoga like me and DDP. Yeah, I, I, I got to go. I got to go dark haired Trish Stratus. Oh, you like the dark haired Trish Stratus? Yeah, I think it kind of, um, you know, it's it, it's kind of a change from, you know, what you normally see in the, uh, you know, the diva division of WWE. Mm-hmm. I uh, see I don't I don't agree with that. I got to tell you, I think that's the perspective, but if you look at the diva division, who do you have? You have Layla, you have uh, uh Alicia Fox, you had the Bella twins at the time when she came back. There were a lot of brunettes. There were probably more brunettes than blondes, but I just wasn't used to looking at her when she wasn't a blonde. Yeah. And so when she showed up and she was thinner and just looked different, you know, yeah, had yeah. less, had, was probably in, be, in, in great shape. She's doing that yoga. It's all I hear is it's fantastic <laughs> by her and DDP, but yeah, she but was with, thinner and had a different yeah. body shape. Yeah. And when she was blonde, she was really, she was like that, that real, you know, real, real blonde, mm-hmm. you know, I guess she like the Hulk blonde, Hogan blonde. Well, she had blonde skin, you know, her yeah. skin was blonde. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's let's start talking about this. Uh, how does this movie start out? Uh, we get the, I guess the, the the rather famous. Let's start at the end, beginning of the movie, where it it starts right away with um, Trisha's character, Jules, has a gun to her head, and she's in voiceover explaining who everyone is and what she does. Yeah, and I guess this the idea behind this 
is so that we get a, a nice action scene right at the beginning, and then we're saying, oh, how do we get there? Yeah. And I've always found with movies that do this, where they're like, and then they go five hours earlier, and they start yeah. building up to it. I forget about it within five minutes, and only when they get to the end, I'm like, oh, right, yes, I remember this now. So yeah. it doesn't work for me. I, I, I'm sure it works for a lot of people. Sure, and then the one thing you do as you get closer, when you if you, if you do remember that, you start to try and figure out how they're going to get back. And then you yeah. also try and remember if it's going to match up. Yeah, and, and you, you kind of lose focus of the movie because you're like, well, nothing – they're not going to shoot her here because they've got to put her in that chair like they did in that scene at the very end. That's yeah, at the beginning. It would exactly. be great if they just threw you off sometime. They kill somebody and they're like, well, actually, I was lying to you at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really Jules at all. And she pulls her mask off. So, yeah, at the beginning, we see Trish. She's tied up. She's in a schoolgirl outfit, which she mentions right off the bat. She tells us it is because to me, it looked more like a waiter waitress at Oktoberfest. Yeah. But she says she's in a schoolgirl outfit. And so it must be like a Thursday or something. <laughs> and then she tells us who all the people are. And so it's her and two other people. They go they go out as a team, three people. And she seems to be the tough one of the group. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, you've got the, the leader, Ridley, who, uh, you know, old, a little bit older. I wouldn't call him an old man by any by any stretch, but he's he's older. And then you got uh, Chase, who's sort of the, um, the uh, goofy muscle guy. Yes. And he's he and they, they explain later that only one of them has has live rounds in their gun. <laughs> yeah. Can you explain why that was? I didn't the the story that they explain later in the movie they're talking to the guy they're holding hostage. They give him this information very, you know, goldfinger style where they're explaining yeah. way too much for no reason. Uh but why? What 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 would be the real reason behind this? I don't I didn't get it. No, neither did I and and I was trying to figure out why they would do this and then I realized that it was just all to make Ridley's plan at the end makes sense right yeah at the very end uh there's a there's a, a, a snafu where the guy has a gun that's not loaded and that is why they had blanks in the gun earlier in the film but it doesn't really make sense i mean they explain it that that way only one of them has live rounds but it doesn't really make sense <laughs> so we go from this opening scene to them in a gym yeah what did you think of this scene uh, I, you know what, I, it was, this was the scene where you realize that this was a film that was working with a budget, uh, and a limited budget at that. There, there's an actress who's playing like a, a gym, uh, uh, I don't know, secretary. Receptionist, sure. Receptionist, that's what yeah. she's doing. And she's standing at the desk there and she won't, she, she's, she's so easily distracted. There's, there's a fight going on. Trish and the other guy are beating up a guy who looks a lot like Tyson Tomko. Yes. <laughs> and she's she's totally, you know, oh, I hear somebody screaming. And the other guy, Ridley, the older guy, the, the guy who kind of I got like a Harrison Ford wannabe kind of vibe from him. Sure. He's at the at the desk and he's, oh, I wouldn't worry about that. That's nothing. Let me ask you more questions. <laughs> and I looked her up. And she's got a Twitter account, but it's not open to the public. You have oh. to be her friend to read it. Um, I also found her modeling page. She's a model out in Canada, and she won't do nudity. Oh, well, good for Which, her. Good for her, although I think this scene would have really helped if every now and then she just flashed him for no reason. <laughs> she's just like, she's like, look, I got to go check what's going on. Woo! And he's like, ah, you know, <laughs> just falls down, you know. And like little like little birds start start flying over his head like a cartoon. <laughs> it would totally fit in this movie. It would. So so they have to they have to apprehend this guy. He's a bail jumper. He's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna get beat up by a girl. So then she beats him up and crushes him with her thighs. <laughs> yes. Uh and uh, in another interview online, Trish talked about the fighting in the film. Oh, okay. um, do right, we have well, any audio of that? Yes, I here. Let me push play on the audio here. As far as when we did the fight scenes, we had a great fight choreographer on the set, and he was very protective in the sense that he would go, 
okay, this is your fighting style, which mine was Crave Maga. And my co-star came from a martial arts background, so we made sure we stayed consistent with our styles. However, I knew my audience would love to see some stratisfaction, and he totally understood that. It was on the forefront to bringing that out and do a little shout out to all my fans watching. Beautiful. Yeah, she that's what she, you know, she wanted to make sure her fans got some stratisfaction. Yeah, and actually this was the only fight in the movie that made me a, a little hesitant when when I for the first fight of the film, it might have been the fact that she was working with a, a very large imposing actor who was probably being very very careful. But everything looked just a little bit too rehearsed in this scene. Yeah. But from that point on, the rest of the fights in this movie, I really, really liked. Well, there, there's one thing I don't like. It's in this fight, and it happens again at the massage parlor fight. The, in the background, at, at some points, you can see them fighting, and they're not even trying. They, <laughs> And this happens even more so later on. But they're just like, well, we're not really on camera, so we'll kind of just go through the motions. <laughs> All right. So this is where they go to the house, and they end up picking up this guy who plays into the major plot of the film. Mm -hmm. So they go to his house. It's him and a girlfriend. It's like every episode of Cops you ever saw. The girlfriend's <laughs> screaming, and he's in the other room shooting at them with a cap gun. Yeah, but at least he's got a sh his shirt on. Yeah, that's true. Unlike cops. <laughs> On cops. No one ever had everybody's it was like everybody's dad, you know, in the nineteen eighties where they'd sit around with a beer watching, you know, sports with no shirt on. Yeah, I think that's how I know I'll never be on cops. Because <laughs> you always have the shirt on. Yeah, or if I ever am, I'll just end up on the cutting room floor because <laughs> the producers he's like, Cut that guy, he's got his shirt on. So they go get the bail jumper. He's got the BB gun. And this is the guy, right? This is the guy that, that gives them the information later that gets them the money, right? Yeah, this is the, yeah he, the, that he basically uh, offers them information on a bigger bail jumper. All right. So at this point, we go to see Jules. She goes to her job, which is at a strip club. Yeah, and, and at first they say strip club, and the, the bail jumper from the back of the van lockup says, oh, you're a stripper? And she goes, no. I'm just a waitress, and I think everybody watching lets out a collective sigh. Ah, uh, <laughs> although she's she looks very cute in her waitress at a strip club outfit. Yeah, and we also get a a, a cool little sort of superhero style suit up scene where she changes out of her her bounty hunter gear and you know puts on her uh, her, her her uniform. Now at this point, is this where we see the customer get? mildly rough with her and her almost kill him no that'll be later when they go to pick her up all right so we'll wait till we get there for that i do want to mention there's a couple movies this reminded me of it reminded me a lot of barbed wire with okay. pam anderson and i sure. think it was just because you had a blonde woman who in barbed wire she's at a strip club early on you remember in barbed wire she's like they're pouring water on her for some reason and she's <laughs> she's stripping and then don't call me babe and she shoots a lot of people but it, this also reminded me a lot of domino sure yeah which was you know a, a, about real life bounty hunter uh domino, domino harvey. harvey which and this is the the daughter of lawrence harvey who was a very famous actor and i really like that film I, I oh, know you did movie. too 2005 this came out if anybody hasn't seen this and they're choosing between bounty hunter and domino <laughs> i'll just say right now domino you should go get it's a great movie uh mickey rourke's in it who was in the wrestler and has a you know a great tie to wrestling because he was at wrestlemania um yeah. But that's a, it's, it's also a female bounty hunter, which this reminded me of. And, and I guess bounty hunters, maybe they do travel in teams. It makes a lot of sense that you would because you'd have backup. And, and the team on this kind of felt like that team. You know, I mean, it, oh, it sure. Was, it had a very similar dynamic to the, the crew in, in Domino. Yeah. And, and that's a, a really exciting film and, and a film that is, it's marred by the fact that she, uh, committed suicide, right? She committed suicide shortly before the movie came out. The the uh, the real Domino Harvey that was played by Kira Knightley in the film. Yeah, I believe it was uh, either an intentional or an accidental drug, drug overdose. Drug over yeah. yeah, 
And and I the other movie that 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 reminds me of to go completely off subject is a movie called Money for Nothing, which is the Joey Coyle story, which John Cusack plays Joey Coyle, which was a guy who found a million bucks on the side of the road in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And when the movie was coming out, he was so depressed about it that he killed himself. And so then you're watching this movie and much like Domino, all you can think about is this, you know, the, the person you're watching is recently dead and, it, you know, has gone from a story that was somewhat tragic to very tragic. But this reminded me of it. This seems like a much lighter version of that. And that is a light movie. You know, I mean, that's a yeah. movie that plays with a lot of, you know, silliness throughout it and a lot of, uh, you know, lighthearted action. Uh, oh, but- yeah. There's a whole that the whole reality TV angle with, uh, the two guys from Beverly Hills 90210. That's right, yes. Uh, Dabney Coleman's very over the top in that. Yeah, yeah, great movie. Um, too bad uh, Mickey Rourke doesn't give it enough juice for us to review it on this show or else we'd be <laughs> talking about it right now. So they get in the van. They've got this guy, the bail jumper. Now, I, I'm, I'm being honest here. From here on, I'm really confused about the plot of this movie. He says that he knows where they can get a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and it's a guy that's holed up at a massage parlor. Yep, a good old rub and tug, as they say quite a few times in this movie. Right. They that was one of the things that I think like the writer heard that from somebody. They're like, oh, yeah. massage parlor, and he was like, that's the funniest thing ever. So he put it in there as many times as possible. But I don't totally get this. I'm really confused by this plot. They're the heroes of this film. Yeah. What they're doing sounds very illegal and wrong. Yeah, yeah. That was, this was a, a, the same point for me where it, it became, their actions became very questionable because, like you said, they're who we're supposed to be sort of rooting for this whole movie. And then all of a sudden they're, they're possibly letting one fish go to get a bigger fish. Right. And, and the fish they want to get, they want to keep this money, right? Oh, it, it, it definitely seems like, well, they would get, it, it sounded like based on his, his, the, the, the bail or the bond that he had jumped, the payout for returning that guy would be a hundred thousand. I see. Yeah. I, it just, it's something about it seemed really sleazy to me. I, I, I really didn't like this part of the movie and I felt it was so overcomplicated. It just, there yeah. was. It, it just didn't seem like this movie needed this. Uh, but this is the plot from here on. So they, they go, they go to this, uh, this club and the guy, so this is where she's gonna, she's gonna work as a waitress at the strip club. Yeah. And a guy, what does he do? He just like grabs her arm and is like, I, you're I pretty. He, I think he pats her, pats her butt. Oh, that's what he does. Yeah. He pats yeah. her on the butt. And like she breaks his arm and and kicks his nose in, and I mean she just yeah. she annihilates this poor man. Yeah, she beats up all three of the guys at the table, and all she does that all while holding a tray of drinks. <laughs> it's a great scene. It's a yeah. really great scene. But I would think that you would not last at that job very long. I, I think there's a bouncer who will come over and say, "Look, don't put your hands on her. All right, you do it again. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you one more time." Because yeah. I would think that's how it goes there. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I would think that, you know, if every night she – and no one even – even like the girl on stage is like, yeah, she's beating up a bunch of guys again. <laughs> yeah. And then she basically leaves. Right. Yeah. So, so her whole day at the <laughs> at the strip club lasted about 45 seconds. Yeah. There's just enough time it almost seems like for Ridley to come inside to come get her and for her to change and, and for her to come out and then them, for them to watch – the last 30 seconds of this one stripper's performance. It's also the, the, the first and only female nudity in this movie that we get. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we get to watch the, the stripper do her finishing move, which is like a, sort of a, I guess she does this, like the James Brown splits. Yeah, she, she, she does a split. I, uh, I do want to talk about Trish Stratus's finishing move. She had mm-hmm. two that are so, so memorable, which I found fascinating. She had the chick kick. Which was that roundhouse kick, which then, uh, Mickey James, you remember Mickey James had the whole story with Trish Stratus where she was obsessed with her. Oh, yeah. And she did the Mick kick. Um, <laughs> but then there was also Stratus Faction, which was she would do a, a springboard bulldog where she'd go up on the ropes and then, yeah. you know, and then run over and do the bulldog. So those were her finishing moves. Far less impressive than the Molina split that we get from the actress on the stage playing the stripper. Yes. So they discuss the deal, 
and they there's a lot of hemming and hawing and oh is this should we do it uh, i don't know you know maybe we should uh i don't know i really thought they shouldn't i really thought this movie at this point kind of goes in a direction i didn't want it to i really thought at this point they should turn this down and get sucked into this somehow Sure, sure. And and ultimately, this was probably just a way to, to pad the movie a little bit before they got Mario, who's the bigger, right? you know, the, the, the bigger bail. This um, may be a good time to point out, this movie is an hour and 20 minutes from very beginning to mm-hmm. very end. And, I mean, that's with credits and everything. It's about an hour and 14 minutes without credits. So we go over to the massage parlor, and here we get... A scene in a massage parlor, which is the same massage parlor that's in every movie you can think of on a lower budget, I guess. But it's the same as in Rush Hour 2, I think, where they go to the massage parlor. It's the same as every one of these you can think of. I I have a little game for you here, Craig. Okay, great. I love games. I pulled up the names of the actresses that appear as massage parlor girls in this movie. And then I pulled up the names of a couple famous pro wrestlers. Oh, great. And I'm going to throw them out, and I want you to tell me whether it's a massage parlor girl or a pro wrestler. All right. All right. The first one is Tram Lee. That's got to be one of the massage parlor girls. You are correct. Tram Lee is. All right. The next one, Hope Champion. Oh, that's, I think that might be a trick question. I'm going to say that that is a massage parlor girl. And two for two. You're doing very well. All right. Takeo Yoshida. Oh, that's um, that's Taka from back in the uh, WWF. That's right. Taka from Taka Michinoku from yes. Kai and Tai. Yeah. Wow. All right. You're doing very well. Three for three. Mm-hmm. All right. Let me throw another one at you. Mm-hmm. A.C. Connor. Oh, that is, well. <laughs> Obviously, that's a wrestler. That's D'Lo Brown. Wait, um, are you Googling these? <laughs> no, you know how much I love D'Lo Brown. All right. I'm going to read the next one. Oh, Nanako Mizutani. Uh, let's see. I am, yeah, that's a massage parlor girl. All right. You see, you're cheating. <laughs> I want to hear you clapping your hands while I read the next one. I want to hear you clapping to know that you're not typing. All right. Jo- Josip Perzuvic. Um, that's got to be a wrestler. It is. You want to guess who it is? Josip. Um... Ah, clap. <laughs> I, I couldn't even fathom a guess. Oh, okay, good. You're not cheating. It was Nikolai Volkov. But very oh, impressive. Wow, okay. Very impressive. You got them all right. I'm still not sure about the beginning. Sounds like you were looking for stuff on IMDb. But That's a fun we, game. We will move on. <laughs> so they go into the massage parlor, and they, they have to choose girls. There's a very funny scene with Boomer at the counter. And at the end of the movie, we get some outtakes. And there's some funnier takes, I thought, on a lot of his stuff. He seems very witty, this guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He uh, Especially in the outtakes, you see it's almost sort of like... Uh, Really, really sort of falling into Kevin Smith type territory in terms of the humor. Yeah. And and I got to say, what's interesting is unless they wrote three different versions of this, he was doing a lot of this either ad lib or he would sit down and figure it out beforehand. But it sounds like the actor was writing a lot of this. So they choose a couple girls. They locate Mario, the fugitive they're looking for. And then the security guy comes up yeah. and he fights with Chase. Yeah. And this fight is great because he just kills Chase. I mean, he just pummels him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He he takes his gun at one point. Yeah. And very much like in uh, in in Lethal Weapon 4, Jet Li did a very similar move, which blew me away at the time. It wasn't as impressive in this, but it was still very good. But this had a lot of where you see Trish Stratus in the foreground. Right. And in the background, you can see them, and I would watch them, and it looked like they were rehearsing. Okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't catch that, um, but that's that's pretty funny. So Ridley comes in, he saves the day. 
I want to talk about Boomer Phillips because I looked him up and he's mm-hmm. got a lot of credits. I I feel that if someone breaks out from this movie, it's him. He felt oh, yeah. like a guy that that you know really felt like he could be the wacky best friend in just about every mainstream film you watch. But I looked at his IMDb credits and I there was a lot of Canadian stuff that may be really popular, but I don't know it. Yeah. And I checked him out on Twitter. He's got a Twitter account. He's got a lovely girlfriend. She's uh, she's famous. I think she's – I don't remember exactly what she does, either a model or maybe a news person. Uh, okay. But, uh, but we're following each other on Twitter, so I've been checking out his Twitter feed. Asked him to come on here. He didn't respond, so I don't know if that's a, a definite no or maybe we'll talk to him sometime in the future. But I went to his IMDb trivia. Okay. And amongst all the credits – you know, that he has, which, again, could be wildly popular Canadian shows. I spend very little time in Canada in my life, so I have yeah. no idea what's big there. There was a bit of trivia that just seemed so odd to me. Mm-hmm. It says, rumored to have played for the Sioux Greyhounds of the Ontario Hockey League. When asked about it, he said, quote, I'm just a fan. <laughs> so that's, that's all within the same trivia section. So they they lay out a, a a rumor and then they debunk said rumor. Right. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. How are you rumored to it? Look, it's not like he's 45 years old or 70 years old where they're like, well, record keeping wasn't very good in the 1970s. This would have been, I mean, he's a young guy. This would have been, you know, in the age of the internet, there'd be a record of the fact that he played for the Sioux Greyhounds of the Ontario Hockey League. Yeah, that's funny. All right, so they get back to the van. They let this fugitive go, which, again, bugs me. Yeah. The girl in the massage parlor calls the crime boss, and here's where we get this great crime boss. <laughs> what do you think about this guy? He 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 has a handful of phone conversations this guy is reading from a script from The Sopranos. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and this is where the, the movie starts to show some of his weaknesses. You you could almost argue that um, Boomer Phillips, who plays Chase, is the only real genuine actor who delivers in this film. Yeah. Um, the gentleman that plays the, the, you know, the crime boss here, like you said, he's reading very, very, you know, stereotypical. Hey, you, <laughs> you going to get your arms broken. <laughs> you don't mess with me. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, it, it's just, you know, very, you know, paint by numbers. So walk me through the next few scenes here. Tell me what happens. So we have moments where Mario's he's begging the crew to let him go. He's trying to let them know why he can't be turned in. And, and at that point, uh, it's, I guess it's getting early, you know, close to early morning. And all, all uh, Jules and Chase want are some pancakes. Yeah, they go to a diner and they leave them in the car again. <laughs> These don't seem like very good people. <laughs> so then Ridley gets a, a call from the from the crime boss, and the crime boss flat out says on the phone, "You give us Mario, turn him over, and we'll give you one one million dollars." Right. Uh, now, and Ridley says, "No deal." Yeah, which doesn't make sense to me because if you're already getting a little corrupt, why not go all the way? Yeah, yeah. And and the the crew argues back and forth about accepting the deal. We get this sequence where Chase shows that he was turned down for the police academy, I guess, yes. due to uh, some hockey injuries that possibly he got while playing for the Sioux Greyhounds. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and there's a line here where he, he reads the letter from the police that uh, where they wish him his uh, they wish him the best in his future endeavors. Crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Trish had to have asked for them to put that in the film. There's no way. Yeah, that, that is such a wrestling random. thing now. Especially it, with uh, with Laurenitis, the last yeah. you know over the last year, which became I think it was on a T shirt, wasn't it? Yeah, and he was yeah. Mister Future Endeavor for a little while. Yeah, absolutely. There's that. If anything, the writer director liked Trish, so he must have been a wrestling fan. But that is an in joke if I've ever heard one. Yeah, yeah. So what do we get next? The um, we have a scene where the crime boss is getting details about the crew from, according to IMDb. A, a dirty cop, but it's never really, he's never really identified as a dirty cop. You yeah. don't really know who he is. Um, but he basically just, I guess, gets, make sure that we know that everybody's up to us, up to speed on who everybody is. Right. And, and we get, we get a, we get a, a scene where Jules gets hit by a car <laughs> and Mario yeah. tries to get away, but then he gets caught again. Yeah. And then and, they drop Jules off at the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. 
This they, they, really bugs me. At this oh. point, Trish Stratus is not in this film. I don't know what happened here. I don't know if it was that, you know, this is when she had to go be a guest host on Raw. Remember when yeah. she had to show up and, and, and get ready to fight with Maria Menounos or whatever, or Snooki? I yeah. think it was her and Snooki. Yeah. I don't know if that's what this was, but she disappears for a hunk of this film. Yeah, you'd think if, if they wanted to get to a point where at the end of the movie – Trish is being held or, you know, is being held hostage by the, the, the crime lords. You'd think that if she was available to film, they would have found another way to do this where she stays in the movie for, you know, a much larger portion. It had to have been a case where she was doing something else. I, yeah, it, it feels odd, too. It's, and even everything about the whole scene, they go into the hospital. There's all these people in the waiting room and he's like, here, take her and. And she's and the the lady at the counter is like, all right, fill out some papers. And he's like, no, here's my driver's license. I'll see you later. Yeah, he's got no time for that. And everything about it, like they rush her right in. I I was once in a in an emergency room. This is not a, a gag or anything. I was in an emergency room sitting next to a guy who was a landscaper, and he was holding a plastic bag full of ice with half of his finger in it. Oh, I don't know how Trish Stratus with no visible injuries, gets rushed to the back. I mean, like, surgeons are putting on scrubs immediately when they see her and rushing her past everybody else, whereas I sat next to a man holding his pinky. Yeah. Well, that was, to be fair, that that uh, this movie was in Canada, so ah. they've got that whole Canadian medical system. <laughs> that might be the difference. I don't know. So we get a scene in the bathroom where the guy is uh, the 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 guy who so this is the dirty cop right? Um, I see that's the thing I was confused. It seemed like this guy was a, a a different guy than the the dirty cop. They looked very similar, but this guy's got like a Russian accent. Yeah, Francis. He's he was the guy that they did the money exchange with that 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 got botched and he gets shot. So. He's in the bathroom cleaning his wound. Yeah, I saw this movie once, and a lot of times for these reviews, I'll see them two or three times. Yeah. I don't think two or three times would have been enough. I think I would have <laughs> needed to have seen this 50 or 60 times to totally get what's going on here. But it doesn't matter. It's one of those movies where you kind of sit back and just wait for the next fight scene. Mm -hmm. We go to this bathroom scene, and there's a hobo in the bathroom. And the hobo has a couple lines here or there where he's like, that's my toilet. I pee yeah. in the sink or, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, that... I sleep over here. He just randomly is, is doing crazy hobo talk. Yeah. And then the guy shoots him in the head and kills him. Yeah, yeah. Well, Francis, um, he's cleaning his wound. The homeless guy's really annoying him. And then uh, he, he, I guess Francis gets on the phone to give the, the crime boss an update on, on what they're doing. And the homeless guy crosses the line and, and, and yes. yells, yells yells on the phone, your buddy's really hurt here. Yeah. I think the, I think he was going to kill the homeless guy the whole time, though. I think oh, was, yeah. I think that On guy's... my way out, I'll yeah. kill the homeless guy. I don't want to do it now just because so, it might attract attention. Um, but I looked the guy up who played the homeless guy. This guy's name was Craig Porritt. He plays – his character's name is Homeless Man. And um, – I assume this is him reprising his role because he played Homeless Man in the 2009 short film Fuel. <laughs> That's great. He's now, his next role after this was Homeless Guy in the 2011 TV series Rookie Blue. Wow. I wonder if he's just a real homeless guy. He also played Hobo in a short film called Pack of Jokers. Okay. Well, he's either really, really got a lock on uh, the homeless uh, homeless man in, in Canadian productions bit, uh, or he's I, homeless. Yeah, he, he looks the part. I guess it's one of those things that people see him and, you know, they're like, he, he's right for it. But I started thinking, I was thinking about his method acting. And I know there were many different actors, Uta Hagen was very famous. She had a method that people would learn. And then there was Lee Strasberg. He had a method. And so I don't know exactly the method he uses, but this is, from what I've learned, the method for playing homeless man, homeless guy, or hobo. Yeah. Homeless man has been on the street for a few weeks. This is the character we're looking at in this movie. He yeah. showers at a local facility or maybe at a friend's house, does some temp work here or there at offices, He's got a minimal odor. He's not, you can't smell him from very far away. Okay. 
homeless guy has been on the street for over a year, showers once a week, but has a lot of rashes. There's a lot going on that you don't want to know about. Doesn't do any temp work because he was caught drinking some toner fluid at the last office he worked at. Smells like an Italian hoagie. Oh, I know that smell. That ho- I know that guy. But then Hobo, he showers whenever his imaginary kangaroo tells him to shower, and he strangled his imaginary kangaroo a few months ago. So he <laughs> smells like the inside of a meat packing plant if the entire plant had just stepped in a giant <laughs> dog turd. And so that's uh-uh. Hobo. Yeah, and, and I've been by that guy. Ugh. I want to say, do you remember, we were in Red Bank, New Jersey. Oh, my God, yes. The, the worst case of athlete's foot ever. <laughs> there, was a, there was a poor, poor homeless man, and I would have given him money, but I had to cross the street. Oh, we, we darted, we jaywalked to get away from him. He had his shoe off, and he was beating his shoe against his foot, and plumes of dust were shooting up away from his feet. His, he had, you know, either terrible athlete's foot or some kind of leprosy. I hope they, someone got him the help that he needed, but I just didn't want to breathe it. Oh, you know, I, know. I, I would have I, dropped my entire wallet for this guy in the hopes that he could get some Dr. Scholes and take care of this. The next, for the next few days after we, we saw that guy, Anytime I had a slight itch in my foot, I got so worried that I had caught whatever he had. I know. I know. I know what you mean. I'm telling you this. Uh, no joke, people. He had he had like a uh, maybe a Ked slip on kind of sneaker and mm-hmm. he was beating it furiously against his foot and dust was just just floating into the air. Yeah. Yeah. It was right bad. across the street from I think it was the Count Basie Theater to give yes. you an idea. I mean, <laughs> yes, indeed. So we get a scene where Ridley and Chase interrogate Mario. Uh, we get the crime boss on the phone with his wife. And, and they're bringing in Deacon and Ruby to handle things. I'm so glad they brought in Deacon and Ruby, especially, what was it, Ruby, I yeah. really like. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, we get uh, a weird line from Mario, though, where he's like, Deacon and Ruby? I haven't seen them in years. He must be serious. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like if he hadn't seen them in years, he would have forgotten that, about them. And if they were really that good, they'd be working all the time. Oh, it yeah. You... Seemed to be a disconnect there. You know, or they'd be out of state and it'd be hard to get them there right away. Mm-hmm. But so Ruby is is a, a very attractive Asian woman. She's dressed as a police officer. She's sitting next to them at the bar. She's almost mute the whole whole film. Uh, she yeah. does speak occasionally in subtitles. Um, but we did find out from the credits that she speaks English. Yeah. When they do the gag reel, we get to see her, you know, laughing and cracking up at Chase's jokes. Yeah. And I think there is one, I think her last line of dialogue in the film, she actually says something in English, but I could, couldn't tell you what it is. Yeah. So, uh, so she's at the, at the, at the restaurant with them. They're eating French fries. They've got the bad guy locked up in the car Mm -hmm. and, uh, Deacon and Ruby aren't very good, I don't think. I, I just think that, the, like, Deacon is looking in the windows of the car, and then he has a long conversation before he confronts, you know, before he really, like, is like, you know, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like they don't know what they're doing. I don't feel they're as good as Mario thinks they are. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. So basically, we get the scene where Ridley realizes there's a cop looking in the back of his van, goes out to talk to him about it, and then, like you said, almost immediately he drops the cop routine and says, I need to get in that van and I need to get Mario because I'm going to kill him. Right. <laughs> but unfortunately for everybody, uh, I guess except the viewers, uh, Ridley does not have the keys to the van on him. Chase <laughs> has the keys. And he's in the men's room where yeah. he sees Ruby. Yeah. And After he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's taking a leak and looking forward yeah. and I, he hears somebody come in. And, of course, he assumes it's Ridley, and he starts saying, hey, have you seen that that hot Asian porn cop? And then he turns, and, of course, it's Ruby. Yes, and uh, there there are a number of outtakes about this at the end, which we'll get to when we get there. So they race to the hospital. They're they're going to get Jules because they've heard she's been kidnapped. <laughs> Again, yeah, but- this feels like this was shoehorned into this film. 
Yeah. Well, they have to have a reason to go to the hospital. So the reason is uh, the crime boss will call them and let them know that they're going to kidnap Jules before they actually kidnap Jules. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. He's very um, Goldfinger. Yes. So Ridley comes up with a plan, and I want to talk about Ridley. This is an actor... I really, I, I, I thought he was all right. I thought he, his performance was good. I think that uh, it was a probably a combination. A lot of times with low budget films, you can't really say, "Oh, the writer did a terrible job." You know, it's such a poorly written script. I think sometimes it's a matter of they write the script and then things happen on the day. They have to change this. They have to change that. They don't get this location, and so sometimes a lot of the, the dialogue is rewritten so many times it doesn't work. But this guy has an interesting bio. Uh, his name is Frank Zupanik, and his bio is interesting, number one, because I, I always like the story of a guy who's kind of older and yeah. chooses to, to go into a different career. But number two, because it's one of the worst written bios I've ever read in my entire <laughs> life. Do you wanna, do you wanna rattle this off for us? Yeah, let's see. Um, born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Frank went to Los Angeles, California. Where, where as did a he team. go? I'm sorry, where uh, did he go? Los Angeles, California. No, no, I'm sorry. Are you reading that carefully? He went to Los <laughs> Angeles. Los, Los Angeles, California, yeah. as a teenager to work on foreign cars. He soon found himself working on camera cars. Let me let me stop you there. Do you think he was going to work on American cars? Because he was Canadian. They would be foreign cars. Or was he going to work on cars from other countries that were not the U.S. or Canada? Because he was going from Canada to the U.S. Oh, my head hurts. To Los Angles. <laughs> All right, go on. Uh, he soon found himself working on camera cars. Yeah, and enjoying the movie industry. Thought he would enjoy acting, so he enrolled himself in acting classes taught by Peter Breck for two years. So Peter Breck was teaching them for two years, so he enrolled in them, or did he enroll in them for two years? We don't know. There's no commas. (laughs) In need of a work visa, Frank decided to go back to Canada to study and pursue his acting career in Toronto. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, wouldn't he want to stay in the U.S. with the work visa? Is he from Canada? He's from Canada. He was born there. So. He wants a work visa. I don't know how this works. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but I, I don't. I don't get it. All right. So he goes to pursue his acting career in Toronto. Yeah. He's and then he uh, Frank started a cleaning company, so he would have the freedom to audition. Okay. I'm not sure how that logic works, but at the there's, same time, he had things start- are, are are not always dirty. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Yes. Uh, I don't have time to come clean for you right, right now. I haven't. So auditioned. at the same time as him cleaning, what did he do? He had started a family and had four children. All at once. So either they're quadruplets or he, he maybe adopted four at once or he married a woman that had four children. But somehow at the exact same time as he was cleaning somebody's abode in, in Canada, he got four children. And with this new commitment, all Frank could do is dream about acting. That's all he could do. He's like cleaning and he's just daydreaming away. Yeah, uh, let's see. And this uh, takes us to 2006. He yes. went back to California. A friend took him to Warner Brothers Studio, and he saw Brad Pitt and George Clooney. <laughs> now, do you know George Clooney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's um, I don't. He's even your have neighbor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he saw George Clooney, according to his IMDb biography, at their trailers while they were working while they were filming Ocean's Thirteen. He thought about how all he ever wanted to do was work with Brad as Frank and as – okay, now this is a really <laughs> tough sentence because no, there's no punctuation, but let me read this. He thought how he always wanted to work with Brad and as Frank turned the corner, he saw Clint Eastwood and thought how great it would be to meet this legend. <laughs> Frank thought to himself, if Clint can do this at his age, then maybe he should revisit his dreams. So Frank flew back and told his family and got their support. In 2007, Frank enrolled in Toronto's Academy of Film and Television, picked up an agent, and started a film career. I like the story, but God, this needs a rewrite. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I I went cross-eyed halfway through it. So we get to the – we're, we're – we're, at the big ending, this is the big warehouse exchange where the crime boss, this is the scene from the beginning that we talked about. And as we mentioned earlier, there's a scene where they talk about how only one of them has live rounds of ammunition. And it 
pays off in a big way here because one of the bad guys gets a gun and it doesn't have bullets in it. <laughs> yeah, they do the exchange, uh, the prisoner exchange Mario for Jules, and Ridley's big plan was to send Mario with a gun. Yes. I guess because they didn't want to really turn Mario over to the crime boss because they knew that even though Mario was a terrible criminal, um, let's read his, would... let's read Frank's bio again. Cause it's far <laughs> more logical than what we're getting here. I don't know. Very confusing here. And then the finishing move comes back and Jules was not the one doing the finishing move earlier in the movie. He's like finishing move. She's like finishing move. And she ducks so he can shoot the crime boss. But, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, everything about that is is so convoluted. It's not like that, you know, if the guy's holding you that you could drop down like that. I mean, she could have ducked. I mean, none of that, it yeah. seemed so unnecessary and silly and forced. Yeah, that seemed like one of those, uh, like almost like movie gimmicks where you'd set something up earlier so you can pay it off at the end. Oh, yeah. But oh, here yeah. it didn't feel earned at all. No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, we get the gag reel. Again, there's some really funny stuff from Chase. There's one scene where he says he's at the – there's multiple takes of him at the urinal and she comes over. Uh, Ruby comes over and he starts talking to him. And start, starts talking to her. So Chase is talking to Ruby and he's like, Hey, uh, why don't we rub our, rub our badges together like our genitals? <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I lost it. I was like, this is the funniest thing. They should have put a lot more of this in the movie, made this movie a lighter, funnier movie. Um, yeah. Very, very funny guy. Oh, yeah. I went on the website as seen by and I found a four star review of this movie. And I want to read you the the first sentence of the four-star review. Okay. Four stars. This is not a one-star review. Yeah. This is someone that liked this a lot. It's interesting to think how much better the film could have been with a clearer focus, stronger script, and perhaps a more sizable budget. Or a different <laughs> film. It's interesting to think what a different film would have been like. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And then he says, but you know what? Forget about it. Who doesn't love a hot blonde in high heels dominating the world around her and leaving a body count behind? What body count? How many people die in this movie? Not very many. Two? Yeah, I mean, it's not like she's blowing up things as she's walking by. This isn't a Michael Bay movie. (laughs) I have a letter. I got an email about this movie. Oh, which perfect. I'm shocked about. And this was from John in Weehawk in, or no, Manahawk in New Jersey. And I was thinking, my goodness, we could just drive over and see him. Yeah. Because we're, because we're in New Jersey. I, I always confuse you got Weehawken, we've got Manahawken. Mm-hmm. And the only way I can, can ever remember the difference is I always think Manahawken, I always go Manahawken Aluki. Is that's all? <laughs> that's what I, because I'm a child at heart. Uh, he said, I had the fortune of seeing an early screener of this film as I worked for a video distributor. The title I saw it under was Bail Enforcers, which we talked about. Mm-hmm. I'm used to seeing lots of low-budget action, so this fit the bill. Some fun moments with Trish and a few above-average fight scenes. Would it have killed them to blow something up? Just curious to see what you two think. And I think they should have blown some stuff up. <laughs> yeah. Even if it was an implied explosion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I did go to IMDb. I just want to read this real quickly. Uh, There was an IMDb thread, and I like to look at the IMDb threads for the movies and actors we we watch. And the thread here on the IMDb message board was, her husband is probably very stratified. Nuff said. (laughs) And then people responded. The first guy said, and he doesn't deserve her. But then the next person said, exactly, I deserve her. And then put a little emoticon of a heart. Uh. And then, then the next guy's like, whoa, he must have done something right. <laughs> just, this guy, Now, this guy, I'm telling you, this guy, 13 years old, thinking, I guess if you do it right, you get Trish Stratus. I think that's, what, I think that's how it works. And then the next one goes, or maybe not, considering the fact that her bio on IMDb.com says separated. <laughs> oh. oh, it's very sad. And then the next one says, LOL, I guess now for him, stratisfaction isn't guaranteed. <laughs> ha ha, emoticon of a laughing person. Uh, so and there everybody's you go. a comedian on the internet. 
There's the IMDB. All right, Craig, it's time for the all important question. Did you tap out to Beth? Okay. Um, this is going to be a really, really hard one for me to do. Uh, you know, as we talked about the movie, I said I, I really enjoyed the fight scenes, some of the performances I really liked, uh, Boomer Phillips. Uh, I think Trish, ha- Trish has a natural uh, charisma. And can I go with a, a dusty finish here where I'm possibly starting to tap? And we get a run in. If you want a run in, you can have a run in. All right, because let, let me explain myself. I I can't recommend this movie, but I can't say at the same time that I wouldn't watch it again. If I saw this uh, flipping channels, I'd probably stop and watch it. If I saw it in the store for five dollars, I'd probably buy it. But I couldn't really recommend it to anybody uh, except for somebody who's either a real big Trish fan. Or kind of likes these, you know, low budget action movies. All right. Now, so I, I was. Going, yeah. So you're going to say it's it, that you're about to tap, and then there's a run in. Yes. The referee gets pulled out of the ring, and then yes. Ted DiBiase buys the title. Yeah. And I promise I won't. I won't make that a, a, a cop out. You know, moving forward on on episodes where I'm unsure, but for this movie, it, it felt like the right finish for me. Well. I'll I'll make up for it because I'm tapping with both hands, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tapping hard. I I tap out when they drop Trish off. Yeah. I I'm not on board with the movie all the way from the moment they come up with this hundred thousand dollar plan. But when Trish is dropped off and she's not in the film, and again we've talked a lot about Boomer. He's great, and and Frank is is good as well. I just, that's not the movie I want to see. I want to see Trish Stratus beat people up and I want to see her in a lot more scenes. I really want to see her on her own in this movie. I don't know that I want her to have a team with her. I think that this movie should have been her against the world. I, I, there's a lot I don't like in this movie and it's hard to, to get past that scene in the movie where she's dropped off and we don't see her for a while. Uh, there's some good stuff in this movie. I wouldn't watch it again. I watched it in three sittings, which is very telling. I, I like to watch movies in one sitting, and this movie was a little tough to get through. I tapped out. I tapped out both hands. I I got my one hand out of the chokehold to tap because <laughs> I didn't think the ref would see the other hand that was furiously tapping. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, that's it for this time. Uh, we'll see you next time on Camel Clutch Cinema. Have a good one. So you want to wrestle, huh? You're too little. We got ushers bigger than you. Leave. I got to take a crack. Don't you see? Your skills plus my skills in the ring. Tag team. Howard Patrols is John Triton. What are you doing up there? Staying away from you. No more rhymes now. I mean it. Anybody want to feel it? What's I smell? <laughs> Jimmy King! Oh my god, a four-post massacre! No one can survive this! This isn't even a